Michael Andrew is one of the fastest sprinters in the world, breaking hundreds of national age group records and being touted as the US's next Michael Phelps, Andrew decided to pave his own path. Rather than take the traditional path, Michael teamed up with his dad and developed a science-based training program focused on race pace training and a high protein diet. His unique training style gathered many critics, but the results speak for himself, becoming a 2021 Team USA Olympian and an Olympic gold medalist. Now preparing for the 2024 Olympic Games, Michael sits down and shares his three favorite tips for all aspiring sprint swimmers, his thoughts on the recent Chinese doping scandal, why he decided to turn professional in the sport of swimming at the young age of 14, and what he's looking forward to at the U.S. Olympic trials. Without further ado, here's today's guest on the Athletes Only Podcast, Michael Andrew. And we are live with Michael Andrew today here on the Athletes Only Podcast. Thank you, Michael, so much for taking the time out of your day to chat with me. Yeah, my pleasure, man. I'm glad, glad we could make this work. Awesome. Well, I would love to just start off things. So if you'd be able to share a little bit more with me about how you got into the sport of swimming and, and what your background is, uh, I would yeah, love to start sure. there. Yeah. So, man. OK, so it started uh, we were living in South Dakota at the time. Um, brief history about my parents. They're both born and raised South African. I actually have my my South African passport here. Um, love it. We they immigrated to the U.S. on agricultural visas and it put them in South Dakota. And so. OK. South Dakota is kind of where they started everything. I was born in Minnesota. We went back to South Africa, landed in South Dakota. My sister was born there as well. So I have one younger sibling. And um, I started swimming when I was about seven years old. And part of why I was introduced into the swimming community was actually through a neighbor. Um, our neighbors of, of ours, I they had an only child. And I would, we were always friends with them, we'd hang out, but I would get in trouble because I always had a ball in my hand, like so rugby ball, soccer ball, football, whatever, but I would leave it in their yard because we had like yards <laughs> that were kind of connected. Yeah. And so he would steal the balls and I would have to do chores in order to like get them back. And yeah. one of these days he recommended to my parents like, hey, like Michael's got so much energy, put him in the pool. It's going to help you guys out a lot. And my dad had already had a background in swimming he actually swam under Wayne Ridden uh, who okay. at the time was national team coach and still works with all of the South African swimmers and so you know he's like yeah this is awesome this will be cool we'll put him in swimming and I love the water naturally and kind of fell in love with the sport and that's when really quickly my parents realized okay there's there's a gift here and it's up to us to now cultivate it and grow and that's just exactly what we did. While many swimmers swim in the club swimming program from a young age, Michael decided to take a different route that was backed by science. Rather than swim tens of thousands of meters a week like many swimmers do, Michael and his dad developed a unique sprint-based training program called USRPT, or Ultra Short Race Pace Training. Not only did the science work, but Michael took the swimming world by storm, taking down national age group records one by one, all while being coached by his dad in his backyard. But rather than tell you about it, Here's what Michael had to say about what makes their partnership so special and why he follows USRPT in his diet to a T. Yeah, there's definitely uh, plenty of highs and lows for sure. Yeah. I think what's been really fascinating to realize is one, nobody supports or loves me more than my parents. And so with when it comes to like what we created early on, I recognize that was all due to the fact that my parents put me in a position to succeed. And sometimes it wasn't the most exciting thing, but I, uh, yeah, my dad's been my coach since I was, I want to say it was like nine. I was like eight or nine when he pulled me out of the program. And then we started working with other coaches, other like smart scientists. We worked with John T. Skinner for a while because we made that South African connection. Yeah. And eventually we just like, you know what? We're going to follow the science. And that's when we discovered USRPT in 2009 and then coined the term in 2011, decided to start our own club and whatnot. But yeah, working with my dad's something that is pretty amazing. I think it's one thing that most families don't have the capability of doing. I think there's a certain dynamic of figuring out, you know, when do you be a father and a parent versus being a coach and a disciplinary? Of course. And so that took years to figure out. And I think what was really vital to our success is the fact that my dad and I both kind of think the same and operate the same. Um, and we're not like 
we're not fighters. We're not aggressive in terms of like, we don't go at each other's throats about anything. It's like, we'll have disagreements gotcha. and we'll hash it out. And I say, I get frustrated more than he does. Um, but he works with me in, in a way that he trusts a lot of my input um, because he knows that I'm very in tune to what I feel and what I experience. And of course, yeah, I just turned 25. So it's been over a decade of being a professional athlete and then almost, yeah, yeah quite a long time of bringing together. So 15, yeah. 16 years. Appreciate you it. You know, when, when people think about swimming, they think high yardage, these guys are swimming miles a day and they're thinking these guys are also mm -hmm. crushing 10,000 calories a day kind of thing. Um, you're not necessarily on that path. In fact, you, you have, as you mentioned earlier, developed this USRPT and you have a very, you know, interesting diet. I would love to get into, you know, what makes an Olympic athlete diet and what is USRPT for all those who are unfamiliar? Well, so I think everything I do revol revolves around like basic, yeah, almost minimalist kind of thinking, okay, what's a simple way to be the best. And for me, USRPT one is the mid like the key point, the number one thing is specificity. Mm -hmm. So when you're getting ready to race, you want to code movement. So we, we understand enough about our body through science and how our brain works and codes movements is through repetition. Exactly. And so the more you can do the same thing over and over at the specific velocity, technique, efficiency, whatever time, and then implant that there creates an automatic output when it comes time to race. Um, obviously there's a lot of other factors that goes into it, your nutrition, rest, sleep, recovery, mental, emotional health, all of that. Yep. But there's a baseline, there's a guideline to knowing, okay, my body's capable. Yeah. And it's just a lot of short work, short rest, same sets over and over. Like my week for the last three, four five years doesn't change much. Interesting. Um, the only thing that really evolves is the times and then we change the strokes for the set. So typically our, we'll do like Tuesdays and Thursday morning is 200 pace long course where we just do fifties um repetitive uh either butterfly breaststroke because yeah. those are the two strokes we're really focusing on now for the hundreds yep. and then everything else 100 pace would be 100 pace breaststroke butterfly freestyle for the 100 breast 100 fly and the 50 free yeah and those are done on like the monday wednesday friday and we'll double about three times a week and swim on saturday too so there's a lot of and it's really high intensity it attacks the nervous system yeah. And so the fatigue is pretty gnarly. You have to balance that. And that's where the nutrition side comes into it. And so we've experimented with a lot of things. We experimented with paleo, keto. We were on for quite a while and, and we noticed great things, but I didn't enjoy it. I didn't like the way that I felt when I raced. I felt like I didn't have that fast uh, twitch that I needed that um, kind of up and go. Mm -hmm. But um, right now what I do is a very high protein diet. So it's kind of keto, okay. but I still supplement a little bit of carbohydrates just to allow for some quick energy. And then I use a ketone supplement as uh, a bit of a kick in the rear to boost cognitive function, because that's where we notice the biggest benefit of eating a ketogenic diet is your brain. And then the way that your body um, uses oxygen efficiently. Uh, and a lot of that comes through science and data journals from Navy SEALs and so forth. It's like, they're doing it. I may as well try it. Um, so yeah, so right now, uh, like a typical day of eating outside of the training would be, I do about four eggs before I go to the pool um, with probably a cup of coffee. And then I put, so Symbiotica is a brand that I work with and I put a magnesium L3 and 8 um, inside the coffee as a little bit of a creamer yeah. and a sweetener. Um, and then I use some shilajit, which is something that's mined out of the Himalayans and it's like a gnarly antioxidant, like <laughs> crazy stuff. Um, and then, uh, so I'll go train and I have electrolytes in the water. Um, and I come back from the pool and I have about six to eight more eggs with bacon. If I don't have bacon, I'll do two brats, which is like just yeah. sausage. So it's high fat, high protein and a protein shake. Um, and then for lunch, I'll typically do tuna and rice with lots of salt. Um, I'm high sodium, like love my salt uh, and mayonnaise for some fat. And then you get your protein from your tuna. Uh, and then dinner is almost always a steak. Nice. Uh, and that's kind of my day. Like 
a lot of meat, a lot of protein. And then my dad also, because we're South African, we, we make biltong, drawerverse and burrovorse, uh, which is all, it's all air cured meat. Oh. And so we use vinegar and then South African spices and we hang it in our garage with a fan on it nice. and you eat it like jerky. So it's like beef sticks and like jerky. And then the burrovorse rolls is actually just like a big sausage roll. And I just throw that in the air fryer nice. and eat it as, as is. But that's, yeah, it's, it's crazy. Like that's the South African way, like lots of red meat, lots of protein. Um, and kind of, it's almost like a pseudo carnivore diet yeah. with a little bit of carb supplemented just for some high intensity. While Michael drew a lot of critics for his unique training style, one thing they couldn't deny was his success in the pool. He broke hundreds of national age group records, many of which were held by Olympic legend, Michael Phelps. This led to many calling him the next Michael Phelps, and Andrew famously declined the comparison, saying he wanted to be the first Michael Andrew. Turning professional in the sport of swimming at the age of 14, he was the youngest swimmer to ever do so, and many were expecting big things out of him. With all the pressure on, here's what Michael had to say about why he decided to go pro at age 14, and what he has to say about the comparison to the legendary Michael Phelps. I think when I was really young, it was easy to, like my parents could block it and shield it from me. Um, and I noticed as, as I got older, I didn't have those uh, kind of barrier to yeah. what's being said. And it definitely affects your mental health. It affects what goes on in your mind. And I started to take a lot of it personally and feel like it was up to me to convince others mm. of why I'm there, which is such a false way to um, approach it as an athlete. Yeah. Um, and I quickly realized there's nothing like there's no amount of records that can be broken in a single weekend or a single season yeah. to appease people or to make them happy. I think generally the people that want you to fail will always find a way to speak negatively, negatively towards the success that you're having. Yeah. Um, and so I tried to shift it in my mind to basically be like, the more hate I have thrown at me it speaks volumes to the impact I'm having in the sport and the fact that what I'm doing is I'm doing it well. Cause I never wanted to be a guy going with the flow, going with the stream, yeah. like not ruffling feathers. Like for goodness sakes, like we developed a training methodology that completely flipped the script, you know? And, and so we were, we were a little abrasive and we were um, disruptors in the swimming world. And I think that was a good thing. And so for me, I just tried to remind myself that, the the hate wasn't something personal it was just people didn't understand what we were doing or who we were and what we stood for and i've noticed the shift over the years as people got to know our heart and the fact that we just love swimming and we take care of the people around us and we are generous with like the knowledge that we've received through failure um i think people have come around to be like oh they're not actually evil people <laughs> <laughs> like they just want to swim yeah. So, and we've heard some crazy things said about us and it's like, whatever, but we've got a strong community. Um, and I'm really fortunate, you know, to have that. And I've seen the opposite happen to good friends of mine where, you know, this, this media culture and, mm. you know, negativity that's put into blog sites and swim blog sites in specific, yeah. it's like those, uh, those, um, comment sections are ruthless. Yeah. And I was the first to say, you know what, screw it. I'm not reading a single article. Even if it's about me, I'm not looking at a comment section. I'm not, it's just not worth yeah. it because whether you like to think it doesn't affect you, it, it still plants a seed. Um, and so learning to protect that was, was huge and vital to my success. And going through and like breaking all those records, a lot of them being Michael Phelps's, like, what was, what was those emotions yeah. like for you? And like, what was it like as, as a 14 year old kid to be like, whoa, like I, I'm breaking some serious barriers in the sport of swimming. Yeah, it was awesome. I think it was something that it's kind of interesting. I do feel like the way that I was raised, I was almost raised in that when we were pushing towards those things or when I was trying to break those records, when it was when it happened and it was broken, we celebrated it, but it was pretty short lived. And that's a kind of a recurring theme you see in sport. And I think that's why there's a lot of mental challenges is you know, it only lasts for so little and you're only as good as your last swim. So if you follow that up with like a really garbage swim, it's like everyone wants to talk about it. Of course. It. It's like, oh, he's done. He's out. 
Like he'll, he's not going to make the team. Like he can't do that. Um, and so I think, you know, we would celebrate it and it was really cool. But then we realized like at the end of the day, these are just national records. Like it doesn't affect anyone. It's not really. And so I tried to, we tried to kind of set the bar so high that it's kind of like shooting for the moon Seriously. landing amongst the stars type of thing where it's like our eyes were set on bigger things. And that was Olympics, win a medal, yeah. like those type of things. Um, and it helped me kind of, I think, stay on that path and push through it and not become complacent with, oh, I've done enough. Like this is cool. Now I can sit back and relax. Yeah. You know, kind of what led into that decision for you to go pro at such a young age? Yeah. So I think the biggest thing for me is we were always raised knowing, okay, what's, what's the end goal? What are you working towards? And for me, it was Olympics, world records, be a professional athlete. I wanted to be a, a pro swimmer. And so when we looked at what it took to get there, you know, I didn't grow up in the, that traditional model where it's like, you got to swim in a club team, you got to go through high school yeah. and then you get recruited and you go to a college and then you survive for four years and try go pro. And so I really fortunate to have parents that are crazy enough to be like, Hey, we don't need that. And so, so I was like, yeah, of course, if I can make some money, That's I'll well. do it. And I think the funniest thing is people thought that I was like making these big dollars early on. We made nothing. Yeah. Like I made nothing. You know, like it wasn't, there was no money for my parents to take from me. There was no money that I was surviving. Like my parents bankrolled a lot of my career early on. Um, and it wasn't until I like established myself as a, a national teamer yeah. and like an international athlete that I started having opportunities to work with big brands like Adidas and then Tier yeah. um, and so forth. And so I, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's interesting. I think people didn't understand at the time. And it's the same thing as like, we just thought differently towards what could be done and what we desired to do. And so we said, screw it. Like, let's go do it. Um, and it was, it was fun to, I mean, I would never, I wouldn't change it yeah. at all. I mean, obviously it'd be nice now having the college opportunity with NIL cause I could have made a ton of money, <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's like, you know what? Like, I love that. I, did something different and it was all part of building the story yeah. and building the brand and just being true to what we desired. Of course, man. As one of the world's fastest sprinters, Michael has a plethora of swimming knowledge. He shares some of these tips in his MA Swimming Academy for all young swimmers who are looking to try out his unique method of USRPT based training. But I wanted to get the inside scoop and I had Michael share his three favorite tips for all swimmers who are looking to take their sprinting to the next level. I think the biggest thing is well, and this, this is more the racing side of it. So I think when, especially when sprinting, you don't have time to look and see what the person next to you is doing. So it's really important that when you do race, you stay in your own lane because the moment you start to swim thinking, what is Caleb doing? Or what is Ryan doing? Or what is yeah. the guy next to me doing? Or what's his strengths, his underwater or his breakout? Or, oh, I have to be fast with the 15 because of this. It's like, you don't have time to think about that. Yeah. And in a 50, it's so, so marginal that if you waste any moment thinking about another athlete, mm -hmm. you're only taken away from your own performance. So I think that's a big thing is learning how to race and race in your own lane and in your own head and controlling the controllables. Yeah. Um, outside of that, I think the technical aspect is huge. Uh, I think there, it's important for a sprinter to find the balance between technical and power. Um, and this mostly I say, just because we're in a new era of swimming where you look at a David Popovici and he's destroying guys that are twice the size, like skinny Kings are fast. And I was like this. I remember the first time I beat Nathan Adrian head to yeah. head. I think I was like 16 or 17. Like I was, I was a bean pole and I had no right to beat him, but I didn't have the power, but I had the efficiency and the grit and i knew how to move my body fast yeah. you know and i was swimming times in 2018 that i haven't hit in a long time and i'm bigger and stronger than i used to be and so there's things that i think you need to understand as a sprinter is you don't need to be this massive muscular guy yeah. uh, or gal to do that as so you can need to learn how to work with what you've got um and then uh i would say the third tip would be figure out what works for you uh, or what makes you confident yeah. in your ability to sprint uh, 50 meters. And what I mean by that is 
obviously I do a certain thing. Another athlete does a certain thing. Like everyone trains so differently, but I think sprinting is one of those things where, you know, you look at like a Bruno Fratus or Ben Proud. It's mm -hmm. like Ben doesn't swim very far. Like I've trained with him. He doesn't swim very much. He lifts a ton, super powerful, yeah. you know? And then you've got guys like Caleb or someone else who can go through these traditional crazy long sessions and swim super fast. So it's all up to you as an athlete, yeah. figuring out what do you believe works? Uh, what do you believe is going to make you faster? And then do that. Cause yeah. if you don't buy into it, like there's no point trying to convince yourself that something works. Yeah. That, so that's a bit broad spectrum. Like that works for every athlete, you know, mid distance endurance, but sprinters, especially you, you can get away with not having to swim very much and still swim really fast. Ahead of the 2021 Tokyo Olympics, 23 Chinese swimmers tested positive for a performance enhancing drug called TMZ and were allowed to compete in the games without suspension. But these reports didn't come out until three years later in 2024, causing many athletes to feel like they were left in the dark and are demanding a much cleaner sport. Swimmers from all over the world, including breaststroke legend Adam Peaty to the United States' distance swimmer Katie Ledecky, are calling for more transparency from WADA, the world anti-doping agency, and are demanding results. With Michael competing at those 2021 Tokyo Olympic Games, I had to ask him what his thoughts were on those Chinese swimmers who are diluting the sport of swimming. It's, I would say one, it's really disappointing is an understatement. Uh, I think it's, it's pretty devastating for the yeah. sport. Um, and it takes away a lot of legitimacy and it makes it a bit of a laughing stock. When you look at WADA, who is supposed to be our governing body for all yeah. anti-doping agencies, like who keeps them in check? Like, no, nobody, like no one's above them. It's like the U S government. Yeah. It's like, okay, what are they going to do? Um, and so I think it's, it's really frustrating when you have someone like that, who's in charge and powerful and it's their job to set the rules, but then not to disobey them when it's clear that they were. Yeah. Um, and so I think it's, it's really frustrating. I think as an athlete, you look at it and you think, okay, you know, I would have been fourth in the Olympics in the 200 IM, you know, maybe had I swam 10th faster, I would have been a medal, like those type of things. And that affects it. Cause you know, and you know, you go into another Olympic year and you're thinking, okay, how many more athletes, not even just Chinese, like it's not really a country on country thing, but obviously Chinata, yeah. uh, the Chinese antidoping agency is to blame sure. for doing this and controlling it. And you wonder why were they able to get away with it? What kind of things are happening behind the scenes that are allowing for shady business. And so, you know, it's unfortunate. Um, cause I think had the protocols been followed, TMZ is, and I don't know this for a fact, so nobody quote me and nobody bash me, but I do think when, if there's a positive test for a substance like TMZ, there's an automatic, um, like a, not a suspension, but there's like a, something like something needs to be done about it immediately. Yeah. Right. And then, so it gets investigated and then it would likely lead to a four year ban. Yeah. Um, and so to know that those positives came from January. And then they raced in end of July, August in the Olympics and nothing was done about it. Nobody heard about it until now, three years later exactly. is mind blowing. Um, and so that's where it's like heads need to roll type yeah. of thing. Like things need to be done in order for that to change. And accountability only goes so far when nothing's being done. And so I think it's, it's important that the athletes speak up, but as sad as that is like, the athletes speaking up is not going to actually make change yeah. like people that can, you know, fire or push or implement need to start doing versus just giving the athletes lip service. And so it is, it's upsetting. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, it's up to the clean athletes to race clean yeah. and to do everything we can to win because, you know, bad people don't uh, get rewarded for that. Things yeah. will always come out. <laughs> There's always going to be bad people out there in the world. And, you know, it's, it's interesting exactly. that you say like, Hey, I would, I could have, you know, I could have been on that Olympic podium and that that's terrible that yeah. they robbed you of that potential even, you know? Um, so. Well, and I, and I think too, like the other sad part of it is, you know, you look at some of the weird things that are happening with, I know there's, I believe there's a Chinese or not Chinese, Australian billionaire wanting to fund. Um, Enhanced games. Enhanced games and encouraging athletes to oh, break a world record using doping. It's like, 
you haven't broken a world record, buddy. You were cheating. So it's like things like this coming out with WADA, it only further legitimizes yeah. and enhances games and something like that potentially being a thing in the future. And so it's unfortunate, like you're not protecting yeah. sporting. Yeah. So yeah. Not at all. With the 2024 US Olympic trials on the horizon, Michael is in full training mode and has some big goals for this summer and beyond. So I had to ask, what's next for Michael Andrew? Yeah, so I mean, I have a lot of big goals. The 20.7, the timeline on that, I don't know if it's this year, but it, it'll come. It will. Um, I do think like right now, obviously the focus is a month out. Yes. Trials, huge. Yeah. Um, make the team in whatever events, <laughs> as many events as possible. Uh, Hunter Breaststroke is a big focus because it's day one and two. So, you know, I mean, like anyone, if you start a meet well, the rest of it, you don't even have to think about. Yep. Uh, and that's what happened with me in 2021. And it's one of those things where you can race free. Yeah. Uh, so that's the goal. Go in there, defend my title. I love to break my American record again. I think I'm capable of going under 58. I would love to be the first American to do so. Um, and then after the Olympics, you know, God willing, make Paris swim, do my best, win a medal for the U.S. Like from there, we have some big ideas um, and it's more, it's still in swimming, mm -hmm. but a lot of it has to do with developing myself outside of the pool and building brands and working on kind of, you know, I realized that you can only do so much as an athlete alone. Um, but I want to be able to kind of stamp myself and know that I've created a legacy and built a brand that can then help and to teach. And so that's where we're going to spend a lot of time in reworking and building our, my academy, yeah. the MA Swim Academy and giving people the tools to succeed like I have. And it's a place where there's complete transparency. I think that's something that's kind of been unique to the way that we've done things and what really made everything a little talk more talked about is we, we don't keep anything close to our chest. Mm -hmm. Like it's complete, like no secrets. If you're crazy enough to do it and you want to beat me, like do it. <laughs> like I want to see it. Right. And so I think that's the thing is I want to be able to give all that back and, and leave something impactful for the swimming world. Um, but then also, cause that, you know, helps me. I want to buy a house. Like I don't yeah. love renting. California is stupid expensive. It's like those little things. So that I'm excited for that because I'm at the age now where like, you know, when I was younger, I was just, I was a kid thinking, oh, I'm just going to race. I want to make teams. I want to win. Yeah. It's like, okay, but well, what are you going to do with that? Like, so now I'm at the point where I'm like, I'm an adult and now I need to prepare for my future family and whatever's to come. That's so awesome. all exciting things. I'll still be swimming till I'm old. Like my, my plans are through Brisbane still. Nice. And that's just because we don't know where the next Olympics after Brisbane is yet. And so... I'm just, I'm here to race. I'm here to have fun. And my event lineup changes every year. And I'm fortunate that I can kind of choose whatever I want whenever we go. Thank you so much for taking the Thank time you. today. For everyone else that's asking, I will start making some more YouTube videos. Soon. And that's a wrap on episode 12 of the Athletes Only podcast starring Michael Andrew. If you guys want to see more swimming content, make sure to subscribe to my channel and go check out Michael's channel as well. He promised there's going to be some more swimming content there in the near future. That's going to do it for this episode, but don't worry. I'll see you guys all next week.